So I'm going to talk about shopping trends, and really my job is to try to see the patterns. My job is to try to see the weak signals. I try to find things that today are very small and that kind of prefigure what the world is going to be in the future. Um, and so I kind of gathered eight trends that I thought are very relevant and will help you understand shopping tomorrow. The first thing is that good news, Monique, good news, Daniel, online equal offline. There is no such thing as e-commerce in five years. There's just commerce. They will emerge because I think the distinction between offline and online will not make sense. My kids, who are four and two years old, do not understand what online and offline means. So let me show you what's happening. You have some brands, this is New Look, for example. They tell you, these are all the ways you can shop. You can go online, pick up at the store, you can go into the store, have it delivered to your home. Definitely brands are trying to go on all the touch points to give a seamless experience across all the channels for the shoppers. The former Burberry CEO, who is now the CEO of, uh, kind of in charge of Apple Store, she's not the CEO of Apple Store, there's no such thing, but she was saying when you walk through the door of a Burberry shop, it's like walking into a website. That would have sounded very, very strange 20 years ago when everybody was busy doing home pages. But now you can go into the shop, you can scan items, you can get information about them on your phone. And there's a lot of hybridation of online and offline. This is a project you've probably seen already. It was in the, in the subway in Seoul, in Korea, made by Tesco. And it's basically a wall with like pictures of products and you could go with your phone and you could scan the QR codes and have the stuff delivered in one hour at your home. So are we offline? Are we online? I, nobody really knows. You know, you're with your phone in the subway. Um, this is the beacons. It's a technology that is going to invade shops. There are predictions that like 85% of the top 100 retailers will have deployed beacons. So basically these are small things that kind of communicate with your phone when you get into a store and they can locate you into the store. They can send you some offers. So you walk into a shop, you get an offer, a voucher or something. So, so again, it's kind of the physical space is pushing you to the digital world. So obviously marketing's dream of that and us as users, after we get the 50th notification, we'll turn it off. So, you know, we'll have to find some balance here. But this is definitely an interesting thing that the physical space is, is sending you uh, online. Another example is what Amazon has released. I don't know if you follow that. It's the dash buttons. So the dash button is kind of the internet of things uh, in action. It's a small device that you put on your wash machine, on your fridge, and you press it and it creates an order on Amazon. And there's just a green light that says the order was taken into consideration, you're going to get delivered tomorrow. So again, trying to get into the physical space, and it's extremely simple. And the buttons are actually, I think you pay them $4, and um, $4 are taken off your first order. So basically, they're free. And all these different brands are releasing dash buttons so that you can order in one second. So I believe that the future of shopping is online and offline combined, and that, by the way, this distinction will not exist in the future. Second thing is analytics. Um, you know, one of the big, big challenge that Google, Facebook, all these companies that are living off online advertising have is to prove that online ads have an impact in the offline world. So there is a lot of work about measuring what people are doing uh, in stores, and uh, this is what you have, if you have a website, Google Analytics, we, you might be familiar with this kind of dashboard. You see how many people came, how long they came, um, what pages they saw. And so this is the offline equivalent. It's a startup called Shop Perception, and they use Kinect uh, technology that they put on top of the shelves, and they are able to see how much time people spend in front of the shelf and how many shoppers came. And so they give you a dashboard that looks very much like Google Analytics, but for your physical shop. And you can see a heat map of which products are performing well. There's a lot of people working on that idea. This is a startup that basically has a floor mat that you put in your store and it's going to measure all the foot uh, steps that are taken by your customers. And again, the idea here is to explain how many people came, how long they stayed, what was their path through the store. So there is a very big challenge about understanding what people are doing with the stores in the offline world. And I believe that we start to see technologies that allow us to understand what people do. If you do a Google search now in the US on a business Business, you might see this little graph here that shows you when that particular store is busy. 
And they actually get that from Google Maps data. They can say how many people are in a certain store, and they can recommend the right time for you to go into a store. And by the way, now Google has also released a technology um, that I couldn't show you because it's invisible, but that tries to understand how much Google Ads had um, impacted your sales. So very big movement towards understanding what customers are doing in the offline world as in the online world. Third thing is content integration. You know, there is, um, I remember 20 years ago when the online world started to happen, people were very afraid that there would be no more distinction between content and marketing. This is very much continuing right now. Um, and you see websites or social media, social networks like Pinterest coming up with buy button. So you're looking at something, there is a buy button. Uh, Twitter has one, Facebook has one. And so you really see that shopping gets embedded into the content. And there are some very interesting examples, like people taking that reasoning to the extreme, like um, Harper's Bazaar, um, who is um, a magazine in the UK. And what they do is that they actually open the shop that relates to whatever was shown into the magazine. So you can go to shop.bazaar.com and you can buy what you saw um, into the magazine. Of course, um, it would be very interesting to see the impact of that on uh, editorial independence um, of such uh, uh, media. There is, you know, systems for buying what you see in movies. This is a company called The Take and uh, you have all these famous movies. You can go and you can see that actually on the screen you can choose the different garments that the actors are wearing and you can actually buy them. Um, even like one step further, uh, there's this French brand called Kiabi, and they came up with the Google Glass. You remember Google Glass? It was the cool thing two years ago. Um, so basically, you, you see someone, and you're in the park, and um, there is somebody who conveniently stops, so you have time to take a picture. And so with your Google Glass, you say, take a picture. And it's going to send you to uh, the garments that they're wearing, kind of something similar from that brand. So there is this idea of, capturing what you see in real time. And there's actually a lot of people working on that, um, which is a very big technical challenge, obviously, to recognize closing. Something that is very striking right now is the emergence, the re-emergence of vertically integrated retail. I mean, obviously, Apple is the poster child. You know, they do their own product. They distribute their own product. They sell their own product in their own stores. And so everybody thought that model was crazy 20 years ago. And now everybody sees that uh, it's actually one of the best models there is. And so you start to see a lot of startups getting into this vertically integrated commerce. So uh, I don't know if you, if you have seen Dollar Shaving Club, uh, which is basically a cheap and high quality razors that you can use and you should check these guys out it's extremely funny uh, their website is very funny that this amazing video when they launched and they have a really re sense of humor is like why the hell would you need like four blades on a freaking razor and you know they're right so they send you these things you subscribe to it and uh, by the way, on, on their cancelling uh, policy, they say, uh, you can cancel anytime. Seriously, we should make it harder. Um, it's really funny, the tone they have. And so it's people that do razors from you know, producing them. Um, and I think they just bought a factory in Germany, or it's their um, competitor, Harris, one of them, uh, to actually selling them. And you, you start to see a lot of companies doing that. So this is Casper that does that for mattresses. Um, if you want to buy high quality, cheap mattresses, there's Warby Parker that does that for glasses. And so it's interesting to see that, you know, we had the offline retailers go online. That was the movement of the past 20 years. And now we what we see is the online retailers going offline. And so these are the stores that Warby Parker is offering so that people can actually touch and feel the product. So very much in line with what I was telling you about the hybridation of online and offline. So a lot of advantages when you do that, I just wanted to highlight a couple, is that when you do your unique product, um, it's very, uh, Amazon cannot really compete with you, so you kind of set yourself apart. And also, of course, because you control everything from production to distribution to online distribution to selling, um, you have better prices and margins. So it's a model that is very intriguing. doesn't work for all types of products, but works really well. Perhaps the most important thing is the new entry points. I mean, um, if you've been on the web for a very long time, you remember that we all started our journey on the web 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, on Google. 20 years ago, it was Lycos and Webcrawler and all these guys, Alta Vista. 15 years ago, Google. So we would go to a search engine and we would type what we are looking for and Google would direct us to the web. And so Facebook came 10 years ago and now Facebook became a second entry point. So you enter, you find content on the web through Google, we kept that, 
and through social media. Now we get stuff recommended by our friends. And now what we see is the emergence of the third entry point, which is Siri, Cortana, uh, Google Now, all these personal assistants. And it's very, very important. Uh, it's going to be it's going to have a massive impact on shopping uh, in the future. This is what Facebook has released a couple of weeks ago. Facebook um, Messenger has a new assistant, virtual assistant called M. And so basically you can go to that thing and you say, hey, I'm in Chicago next week and I'm looking for a great burger. Can you recommend something? Or you say, I have some friends just had a baby. Can you recommend a gift for them? What you see here is kind of the, the third place where brands will have to compete. Just like Google is a black box, you don't know, you, 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 kind of, you can fight to be in the top 10 uh, results, and all brands do that. You have to fight to be on social media. Now we've got, we're going to have to fight to be in the answers given by these machines. And um, it's going to it's gonna be as usual, you know, why is Facebook recommending these shoes? Are they independent? Are these people paying to be here? So it's, a, it's the third time this happens that we have an entry point that is appearing and that we have to take into account. And um, I showed you what, one of our investments in India is a company called Lookup. So what they do is kind of a, a consumer to business, WhatsApp. So businesses, small businesses, uh, India has the largest density of small shops in the world. So small businesses install the app and then people can chat with them and they can ask for stuff, they can ask for delivery. And obviously there's going to be payment integrated into the app. And they work in a very interesting way. So when you make a query, it actually goes to the shop if they have the app. But if they don't answer in five minutes, then somebody picks up the phone and calls the shop to find the answer. And if the shop doesn't have the app, then immediately somebody calls the shop to find out. So there's going to be a lot of these things. This is in another app called Agent Q. So this one tries to be a bit smarter. You can ask it like more general questions, like you know, I want to buy a toaster, and it's going to uh, you know, write a thesis about toasters to you, and you can choose which one you want. But it's very much a new entry point that everybody has to be aware of, and I believe it's one of the big fighting grounds for brands in the future. Another thing that is reaching, changing all of our society, not only retail or shopping, is artificial intelligence. So we start to see more and more things being automated around us. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. Like, I, I remember when I was a kid, I would hear my parents say, uh, factory workers are being replaced by robots. Now what's happening is that it's white collar people are being replaced by robots. Um, uh, 22,000 articles were written by an artificial intelligence for French newspaper Le Monde during the last elections. From the data, they would produce 22,000 articles. There is a project for virtual uh, uh, artificial intelligence psychologist. Um, there are people working on automated weapons, of course. So automation is very important and you can see that it's happening in commerce, and it takes a lot of different forms. One is price automation. So this is, there was a very interesting article about how many times Amazon has changed the price of the Bible over the past two years. And you see that they have some algorithms. I mean, I don't really know what it is. Maybe when there's some like holy, uh, holidays, they kind of switch the price up or whatever. Or when the Pope is visiting country, maybe they, they spike the, they, they put the price up. But it's very interesting that you see that there's more and more um, uh, algorithms that are determining the prices and as usual on the internet when something happens there is always the counter something happening so this is a really cool startup called Paribus what they do is that they monitor prices in real time and if one of the brand that told you if you find something cheaper elsewhere will pay you back they automatically find out so people <laughs> set the price automatically people get their money back automatically this is the beauty of the 21st century this is a bit of a joke but this is this is a signal of what's going to happen. This is um, a Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's a university very advanced when it comes to robotics. And so they have a shop and they deploy the robot. And so the robot is, of course, uh, not doing much, except that it's scanning all the shelves. And it's telling shopkeepers if, something, if some items need to be restocked. Um, Automation is going, to, is going to have a very big impact on delivery. You know, delivery is a big issue for brands. Uh, this is actually the project that Google is testing right now in Australia. 
where you have drones that are going to deliver uh, the goods. Uh, of course, lots of constraints right now. I mean, there's not much autonomy. Um, you know, nobody's sure about what the regulators are going to do, etc. But very promising things to serve some very rural um, uh, places like, uh, like, like you can find in Australia. And by the way, if you think this is science fiction, Amazon was just approved with testing their own delivery drones a couple of uh, weeks ago. Second to last trend um, that I think is, again, it's a major social trend that we see that has an impact on all of us and on everything we do, uh, whether it's our lives or it's our businesses, but it's transparency. I mean, obviously, uh, you've all heard about WikiLeaks and Snowden and all that stuff, and uh, basically information, as soon as it's stored on a computer, it kind of starts to get itchy and it wants to be free. And so transparency um, is forced down the throat of retailers in very interesting ways. This is a little extension called Shop Genius, and you put it on your browser, and as soon as it detects that you're on an e-commerce website, what it's gonna do is that it's going to give you a drop-down menu with the prices that all the competing websites are offering for the exact same item. So in real time, you can compare the prices, and you can actually switch to walmart.com or whoever has the best price and is going to try to screw you on the shipping cost as usual with e-commerce. But that's another story. Um, so it's very interesting because it's an extension that you put on your browser and there's nothing you can do against that as a retailer. You cannot prevent people from putting that. Another example is Avoid. Um, it's a plugin that you, again, add to your Google Chrome or Firefox navigator. And then every time you go on a website and you see a product that involves uh, child labor, that product is going to be removed automatically. You don't have anything to do. You're just browsing Amazon.com or whatever, and from the normal view on the left, you get the updated view on the right. These products just disappear. So there's nothing you can do as a retailer. It's a very interesting movement. You know, it's, um, these people have a database of which brands are, according to them, using child labor, and they just remove the products. Nothing Amazon can do. Nothing any retailer can do. So there's a lot of transparency going on and um, about performance, about prices, about ethics. And it's, it's very, very interesting because um, it shows the counter power that uh, users um, have. The last thing I want to talk about is I believe we're going to see rehumanization. I hope it's a word. Um, basically, this is the society we live in, my favorite news of this year so far. Woman attacked by robot vacuum cleaner in South Korea. <laughs> it's great, all these robots. It's amazing. But my God, are machines stupid. You know, this woman, this poor woman, she was sleeping on the floor, like on, in Korea, you, you sleep on like tatamis, and her hair came out when she was sleeping, and the, the freaking vacuum cleaner came, and it started to tangle her hair, and so she had to call 911 so that they would help her out. So, you know... <laughs> It's great that we automate so many tasks, but we need to rehumanize also as much as possible. And it's interesting because you start to see weak signals that this is happening. Costco, the very big um, discounted retailer in the US, has removed self-service checkout and they put back um, uh, cashiers. Because they, thought, they found out that in the end, the cashier says hello and creates relations with the, with the customer. It's not too bad of a thing. And there is also Never, um, uh, you'd never have to reboot a cashier. Um, Toyota, interestingly, you know, Toyota is the, the one model for the whole car industry. And um, I had a joke about uh, car industry, but I, I was told not to make any joke about car industry in Germany today. Um, <laughs> so I will keep it for myself. But, um, you know, Toyota, uh, of course, like every car maker, they started to uh, put some robots into their factories, and they actually, in Japan, starting to remove the robots. Why? Because they found that robots are very bad at improving what they do. They're very bad at reporting what I do here could be done in a different way. So they bring back all these workers, and actually some very uh, senior workers, back into the production chains, because they, saw, they, they found out that having the robots producing the cars was basically... Uh, preventing some innovation from happening. Uh, you have other things happening. This is Enjoy. Enjoy is, uh, you know how um, 
some, some people struggle with electronic devices. So this is a system where you, you can buy an iPad or an iPhone and somebody's going to show it, show up to your door in less than four hours. And they're going to take the time with you to set up the device, to walk through the first steps and to, you know, jumpstart you in using this device. So this is really recreating the human touch in e-commerce. Uh, this is what Amazon has done, is the Mayday button. If you have a Fire tablet, uh, there's actually a Mayday button. You press it and then you are connected with uh, somebody from user support who's going to help you and is going to chat with you through video. So again, bringing a human touch. And another thing um, that I wanted to highlight is this extension that I found very interesting. I think, you know, People realize that um, going too far into e-commerce is going to have an impact on our neighborhoods and that the small shops are going to die, etc. So this is an extension that you add. Um, and basically what it does is that you browse Amazon. And when you start to see a book, there's a little thing that is added to the page. And again, it's done by an extension, though, so there is nothing Amazon can do to prevent that. But it's a little button that gets added. You see the Kindle button, you see the paperback button, and there's a local bookstore button because they are connected to the stocks of all the local shops and they know where you are browsing from and they can tell you, hey, this shop close to your home has that book at that price. So this is, in a way, rehumanizing uh, commerce and I believe that um, there will be a lot of that happening. So these are the, the, the things I wanted to tell you about. There are other uh, things I skipped uh, for lack of time. Um, I mean, if you're interested in, in, in retail, look at China, look at Korea, look at Japan. These guys are 10 years ahead of us. Uh, if you think that WhatsApp is very, um, is very uh, innovative, just look at what WeChat is doing. Uh, they, they had like 1 billion people uh, transferring money through the app earlier this year. This is amazing what they do. There's a lot of stuff happening with virtual reality that actually you can get uh, embedded into a store from uh, remotely. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening with augmented reality, which you know you go into the shop and you don't have to try the clothes on. There's a screen that shows you approximately how the clothes will look on you, so you don't have to try them. So there's a a lot and a lot of things happening and um, perhaps the, I'm going to leave you with, with one thought uh, which is that uh, it's only the beginning. Um, we've seen a lot of industries have been very very much disrupted by technology like the music industry, uh, to some extent the movie industry, the media industry. Some of them have are just starting their revolution. Finance is basically starting its revolution. Healthcare is starting its revolution. And uh, retail is also just starting its revolution. And this is a very interesting graph from uh, Bain, the consulting firm. And they try to kind of quantify how much change we have ahead of us um, uh, per industry. And you see that, uh, so the dark gray is actually change that already happened up to today. And the light gray is change that they expect until 2020. And so you see that um, there is a lot of change coming up in like pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, um, med tech, education, and uh, obviously retail. Uh, so I see you guys taking pictures of the slide. I already put them on SlideShare just before I was here, so hopefully you can find them. Um, thank you very much for having me today. I wish you a great creative day. Thank you. Thank you. Laurent, Laurent, we have a few minutes, so take a seat. Um, you're describing a lot of things that are happening today, and whereas I don't like shopping, I do like technology. So all these new technologies coming up, I mean, you mentioned a few, like image recognition, video recognition, voice recognition. Um, it sort of does suggest that the people that will be the best in e-commerce, well, right now and in the future, are the ones with the best algorithms, the best databases. It's a software business. Everything in e-commerce is a software business, even if you algorithmically get connected to some assistant somewhere in India who tells you what to buy. It's a very interesting thought because, for example, I, I, I do, as I live in Switzerland, you know, one out of two person in Switzerland works in banks. So I have discussion with the bankers and they tell me, oh, you know, trading has become automated now, 70% of equity trading is automated. We're going to be out of a job. And I say, but it's, look at what happened with planes. In planes, we have the capacity to fly planes automatically since maybe 10 years. But we still have pilots in the planes. Because some things can be automated, but for other things, you want to have a pilot. And I believe that my personal belief is that the future is a mix of both. Perhaps having interaction with 
a human person will be a luxury, as you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, because I still think that there will be a, a very big part of the population. But with, that with software, will not you can connected. distribute it and connect. And so, and software will certainly be an advantage, but um, I think the, the human touch will always be very important. So, th there will be two ways to have an advantage either through software or through like super I would customized like to argue that service. That the, the human factor actually is outside of the e commerce companies in the sense that the social networks are basically your, your shopping guides. They tell you where, how, what, when. Yeah, but that's until you know that your friends are pushing you some things because they get a commission on it, for example. You know, like, like a lot of things happen. So, uh, <laughs> you have friends like that? <laughs> uh, it's, of course, you know. Uh, really? Come on, bloggers. Uh, bloggers do that all the time, you know. So yeah, bloggers, bloggers. The, the thing is, um, you know. <laughs> I think one of the key lessons I learned, for example, I go to YouTube and I look at the most watched videos and it's crap. You know, it's not because a lot of people like something that I like something. And really look at the top videos on YouTube. It's like, you yeah, know, cats dancing. So, but then I, you, you, you need to make new friends. I, I, I'm trying. I, I'm actually <laughs> planning to go into this room and like, get new friends. You, sir, we'll meet after. Hi, Hi friend. But no, seriously, my, my media diet is now completely controlled by whatever people throw at me on Twitter or Facebook. But it's, it's you know, try to... Uh, one example I'm using. If you type buy a car in Google, you get like one trillion results. You know, so there are things like buying a car. Who are you gonna, wh how are you gonna do that? You cannot go to Google anymore. It doesn't make sense. You know, you have like five million brands competing to be so number you one. Are, you ask your brother, so you right? have to I mean find <laughs> one friend, but you have to curate yeah. friends. You have to find the right person, but you go back to the human touch. And perhaps if you see some brands that are able to recreate some, some expertise and some trust, which is what we lost with so many brands, I will never ask a car salesman for which car I should buy, because I know he's not going to give me an objective answer. But perhaps that's a job of the future. It's somebody telling you, um, I understand what you need, I'm going to listen to you, and I'm going to recommend you. You know, some kind of brokers. I wouldn't be surprised that there would be human brokers for certain things, if, and computer if, if brokers you, for other things. If, if you look at this world, do you think that the existing retailers, commerce parties, you know, can do this? Or do you think it will be the new upcoming huge companies that will completely take over? Especially when it comes to artificial intelligence and image recognition. These are not easy things to pull off, right? I mean, this is hard work and it's, the scale works. So if you look at the music industry, I mean, you have a lot of new players like iTunes and Spotify, but you still have the majors. I mean, there used to be five, there's four of them. So one died, four made the conversion. So um, I think that the future is always a mix of uh, incumbents and startups. It's not black and white. That would be too easy. Um, so there will be a lot there's, of there's, there's changes. How many, how many people in this room are from e-commerce retailers, existing ones, not from Google trying to buy, sell and buy stuff, but e retailers here in the audience? Ooh, gosh. Do we see one over there? Just the one. Oh, there is one guy, but he's really shy out there. He's like, oh, I'm the only one. It's I'm not, not going to say too loud. I, yeah, I looked at the list. There's a long, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are quite a few Thank people. Thank you for coming. We'll reimburse <laughs> your ticket. Okay, he's your new friend. <laughs> well, we no, have, but it's, yeah. it's, you see, for example, it, it's very interesting when you see the convergence. Like, you have two types of actors that are converging, and they are both coming from different ways. You know, there has been rumors of Amazon opening stores for a very long time, and they actually did open some kind of stores, like pick-up okay. points. Google has opened stores in uh, London. On the other end, you see all the traditional retailers going digital. So, for example... No, but it's just, I'm saying, if the heart of commerce is algorithms and software and, and matching and artificial intelligence, then companies coming from that field with that strength stand a much better chance than, you know, it is, but somebody I, I with a lot of I think also very often uh, from center. our perspective as, you know, tech people, we forget how hard real business is, how real life is. I mean, if you look at Google Wallet, you know, or if you look at the Amazon Wallet, these guys came and they said, oh, finance is easy, you know, just put okay. your credit card number and, you know, people will pay. And what do they get? They had to shut down after six months for Amazon. And Google had to shut down and now they are kind of coming back. And by the way, when you look at what Apple is doing, Apple is seeking approval from all the different uh, companies. You know, they have to work with the banks. They have to work with the people moving the data from one point to the other. They have to work with the hardware makers who, to allow them to do their phone. So from a Silicon Valley office, it feels like, wow, oh, you know, these people, they've been in business for 40 years. What they do is so easy. And their expertise doesn't count anything. The reality is that these jobs are very complicated. Retail is very, very messy. 
There's so much crap happening. Like Daniel was saying, you want to send back something. What do you do? And so it, it's not that simple. And do, do you think but there's a clear movement of conver convergence. In this view where, where the convergence, um, I mean, one of the thoughts that, that people that think that everything will go online anyway, or will be distributed uh, in cities by driverless cars, or city centers will change. They already are changing, of course. I mean, I can see it in Amsterdam, you know, shops are moving. Yes, it's, it's true, Monique, but we forget, you know, there is still... Uh, I was in India yesterday. It's nice to say that, right? You know, uh, and... <laughs> no, but... We, we, maybe there's going to be automated car in San Francisco in two years. It's yeah. not going to happen in India for another very, very yeah. long time. So we forget that there's 3.5 billion people online. There's, there's like 3.5 people that are yeah. 3.5 billion people who are and not the, and, online. And the shop on the so we are a bit in a bubble. We have to yeah. not forget that we are different than um, most of the masses. Even if every day there's more people becoming going online and changing, updating their mentalities, there's still a, such a long way to go. Well. Thank you for Exciting that. times. Yes, exactly. And you are going to make this happen. Right? Thank you for your contribution. And we'll have more shops. So we might come back to you later on with more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laurent.